All praises to the Most High. Shalom to my Hebrew brothers and sisters and those that are cleaving to the house of Jacob. It is another day the Lord has blessed us with. And I am glad to be back to finish up the message, a part two, of course, of the weapon of prayer. And yesterday we gave a, a host of scriptures that uh, explain how powerful prayer is in our lives and the necessity of it. Very, very uh, informed broadcast with lots of scriptures that just break down the necessity, the essentials of prayer in our lives every day. And how prayer, of course, uh, is our weapon because we go straight to the Most High in the Spirit. And, of course, we mentioned that it's basically the portal uh, in the Spirit, if you say, to combating, bringing down, rebuking, binding, loosing, uh, everything that we uh, need is accomplished in prayer when we go to the Father. We talked about... Um, Making prayer uh, with supplications unto, unto Yahweh and with the contrite spirit, broken heart and contrite spirit, the Most High said in no wise will he despise. And um, we talked about, you know, believing when we pray. And uh, that's very important, having faith when we enter into the presence of the Lord in prayer and praying without ceasing. We talked about that on yesterday constantly in prayer and we talked about the posture of prayer because whether you're walking whether you're lying down whether you're on your knees whether you're standing up turning to the east is 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 it's the motion in the heart of always being in the presence of the lord in the spirit of your heart praying that that is so important because so many times we can feel like, oh, I, I got to hurry up and get to this place so I can pray. But, you know, prayer is an attitude of, of the spirit wherever you are, in your mind, in your heart. And that's what we're going to begin this scripture with today, uh, where we talked about the meditation of the heart because when you pray you're praying from the heart and that's what matters so thank you all for tuning in to the broadcast and we're going to get up to date now with part two the final part of course for today of the weapon of prayer. We pray the Most High bless the broadcast that those that have an ear will hear and that your spirits may be edified and the Most High will be glorified. So Psalms 19 verse 14 says, Let the words of my mouth, because you know we speak words, you know, most of the time, oftentimes, of course, when we pray, we are, we are using words, you know. We are uttering out speeches to the Lord. And then we want to, you know, start right here and make mention that it's also good to listen in prayer. We talk about the posture of prayer or being prostrate or wherever you are, sitting down, laying down. But listening, listening for the voice of the Lord. Silence is a powerful posture of prayer as well. Silent. The state of mind of meditating and being quiet is the posture of prayer. That's what we're going to read here in Psalms 19, 14. Psalms 19, verse 14 again. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. That is where we can really listen to, to the Lord. To the Holy Spirit that's speaking to us of what the Lord is saying. And even if we don't hear anything at that moment, we know that we've, we've given room to be silent in the presence of the Lord. And 
have been in in some cases some people you know many times and we sometimes may not have the words to say but it's that it's 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 in his presence is what make a difference in his presence and so the meditation of my heart because there are things in our heart the mind and the heart as we talked about yesterday are the same what you feel thinking uh, what is in your heart is in your mind you're thinking that you're thinking what's in your heart you're thinking what's in your mind is coming from your heart. Pondering. Meditation. You can just, without words coming out your mouth, you can meditate. And and the prayers of your heart, and, and pray the scriptures from your heart. You know, the scriptures that come up in your heart, in your mind, <clears throat> so like, yeah, that is just, the, mo the Holy Spirit understands the thoughts, we, we talked about that scripture yesterday, that the Most High is a God that discerns the intent of the heart. So he knows what's in our hearts. So we are thinking, we have to make sure what we're thinking reflects what's in our heart. Because we want to have a pure heart before the Lord. And that, that is a way our prayers can be answered when we have a pure heart before him. The meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Yeah, we want what we're thinking, what we're uh, pondering in our heart to be acceptable to him. Acceptable. Because we talked about yesterday that, you know, the enemy can't get in your prayers or in your mind, in your heart to, to know what you're praying. That's the secret place of the Most High. The secret place. That's why he said again, uh, when you pray, enter into your secret closet and the Father will see it. You see if you in secret will reward you openly. See, that's the secret place. There's a secret place of the Most High. A beautiful secret place of the Most High. And that's what, that's what we're aiming for. That secret place. So we're going to move on to another scripture here. Uh, just to recap and, you know, get you up to speed. To speed. And, and of course, talking about the secret place and the, the closet, the secret place of our hearts in prayer is Matthew 6 and 6. And we, we did a great deal on talking about uh, not using vain repetitions, and that's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, of course. N not using vain repetition as the heathen do. Because what? They're praying long prayers. They're praying loud. We want to be able to make sure that our motives are right when we're praying. That's why it's a secret thing. That's not thing. That's why prayer is a secret relationship with the Most High. It's secret. Because you're sincere about what you're praying, who you're praying for, is secret. The Most High hears our most silent, shortest prayers if it's coming from the heart. That's just how much of a compassionate God He is. We talked about asking on yesterday. You know, uh, asking amiss. Those are vain prayers. Well, people ask for things because they're lusting after it. They're asking for things because... Uh, the lust of their flesh with evil intentions. And we know some of those prayers can lead to witchcraft prayers. And the Most High definitely don't hear those prayers. Why? Because he doesn't hear sinners' prayers. Why doesn't he hear sinners' prayers? Because a sinner have no intentions of serving the Most High. They have no intentions of giving their lives to the Most High. They want the benefits of having 
prayer is answered, but it's never for the glory, the glory of the Most High. Never. They're sinners. They're going to keep doing what they're doing. They don't have any remorse, any conviction, any guilt, anything uh, concerning their evil ways as a sinner. You know, sinners are not going into the kingdom. So why would the Most High answer their prayers? They're doing what they're doing here on earth. And, you know, the prayers that they pray they think it's going to be answered because they're praying. But the Most High is looking at the intentions of their hearts. And he's not even answering their prayers. Very serious thing. Very, very, very serious. Talk about intercession, making supplications and prayers and intercessions unto the Lord. And giving the thanks uh, for all men. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, of course. And uh, we talked about, like, first of all, supplication be made for uh, people that are in leaderships, all those that are in authority, elders, bishops, whomever is, you know, leading the nation, leading the nation. And of course, you know, you're married, you pray for your husband, the head of the house. Because those are the people that are protecting us, leading us, uh, you know, guiding us. So leaders, elders need prayer so that they can continue to do the work of the Lord and not have to fight so many battles because they're already fighting battles. Anybody that's uh, handling the word of the Lord and leading people, a nation, a people, uh, you know, they, they are really fighting battles. We talked about even in the judiciary system, magistrates, and, you know, we pray for these areas of, of, of authority because the Most High wants to get in there and change over and move and touch the heart of the king. As the scripture says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it whatsoever way he will. So we, we need the Lord to um, get into the king's heart. Okay, we want to, um, let's look at Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Prayer is a weapon. It is definitely a weapon. And our lives should get excited when we talk about prayer because we know that when we cover our lives with prayer, because that's what the Most High wants us to do. We obey and pray. I mean, we, we're covered. We have the Spirit of the Lord and the Spirit of grace. We are definitely covered. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 said, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always pray, not faint. Very powerful scripture. Very powerful scripture that the Most High has given because in Yahweh Shai name because prayer keeps you from fainting. Prayer will keep you from fainting. And sometimes prayer is the hardest thing that you know some people struggle with that they don't want to do. Like prayer is boring or something. Like that that's fainting in your spirit when you feel like you don't want. The most comfortable position in your life should be prayer. See, the, 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 the spirit has to break through the flesh, break that flesh down to pray. Because, see, Satan is in our flesh. The adversary is in our flesh. And what the adversary don't want you to do is pray the right way. Having pure motives and a pure heart. Let's look at Psalms 34, verse 17. The 34th division of Psalms. And we're going to look at verse 17. 
24 Pigeon of Psalms. And we're going to look at verse 17. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. He delivered them out of all their troubles. Let's look at verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are, are of a broken heart, and say to such as be of a contrite spirit. See, that's why the Most High want to see that brokenness. He wants to see that brokenness in his people. Broken in a contrite heart. He is not. But what, verse 17, he hears the cry of the righteous. He heareth them and delivereth them out of all their troubles. This is why if you want to be delivered, if you want to see change in your life, you have to begin to love a prayer life. You have to be able to know that this is where your power is coming from. Everybody want to be powerful. Everybody want to, you know, get out of their troubles. Everybody just want peace. Everybody, But they don't want to do the things that the scripture is telling us that brings the peace, that brings deliverance. They don't want to do the necessary things, and that is prayer. It's for our own benefit. It's for our family benefit. It's for our nation benefit that we come together and understand how powerful prayer is. Especially praying for one another, as we mentioned on yesterday. Scripture admonishes us, pray for one another. Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another, what? That you might be healed. Those prayers are ascending up like incense because that's what prayers represents in the Old Testament. The Old Covenant, of course, when you, you know, have Moses or the uh, priests, the high priests administering, administering the holy things and the holies of holies, the temple of the Lord, the incense represent the prayers, the prayers of the saints. Going up before the Lord, pure, a sweet-smelling Savior unto him. So when you pray, you slay the enemy. Every time you pray, you slay the enemy. Angels are all over and around you, slaying giant demon enemies. And you got to wait in prayer. We talked about that, having patience after you pray, waiting on the Lord. Praying fervently, having patience. That's why in verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered them out of all, delivered him out of all of them. Because you pray, you have that broken and a contrite heart where you're casting your cares upon the Lord and he heareth you. So yeah, I love this verse in Luke 18 and 1. Men ought to always pray and not faint. That is how we're not going to faint. We're not going to faint when you when you when you pray. You're going to have the strength you need to endure, go through, and battle whatever it is you need to battle. We're going to look at. We know that we everyone is familiar with our Father prayer, and and in that our Father prayer, we talked about the kingdom, praying that kingdom come. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, the, the, the Our Father prayer is really teaching us what we sh how we should pray, what we should pray. In, in Matthew chapter 6 verse, let's go, let's go there, Matthew chapter 6. And we want to let's start at, of course, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. See, after this manner, our Father, you know, praying to our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, which are in heaven, hallowed, give him the hallowed, the reverence. 
be thy name. Give him all the glory and you get it out of here and pray. Lift him up. Praise his name. Thy kingdom come. That's what he want us to pray. You got to pray, what is the kingdom come? You got to pray with the king, his kingdom, his kingdom of peace, his kingdom of deliverance, his kingdom of fighting our enemies. Pray the kingdom. Pray his kingdom of righteousness. Pray his kingdom. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. That's what we want. We want the kingdom to come. Because in the kingdom is his will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. That's what we want to pray. Lord, let your will be done on earth. Saints got to get together and pray this, these prayers about the kingdom coming. We know it's fasting and uh, coming upon us for the things that's happening. Thy will be done, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. The daily bread of his word. For man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Yahweh. The bread is the word. The life giving word. You know the bread. The manna from heaven. We have to have the word of the Lord every day in our lives. Pray the word. Speak the word. Put that word out there in that atmosphere. It's, it, I'll tell you that the scripture say, cast your bread upon the water, and, uh, many waters, and you will find it in many days. Cast your bread out there. Cast your prayers out there. Them prayers ain't going to waste. Them prayers is working. You praying in righteousness, your heart is pure. Them prayers coming back. They're coming back. And go on to tell us even more how to pray. Forgive us of our debt. As we forgive our debtors, you know, repentance, confessing our sins. And praying that he lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We got to pray that the Most High keep us from evil. Keep us from going into temptation. Because what the enemy will really want to do is trap you. He want to trap us. That's why he set up temptation. Temptation is set up to trap the saints. To take away their spirit. To keep them in sin. To blind their eyes. To keep them in self-righteousness. Any type of temptation. You know, we, we need the Lord to keep us from temptation. Let's go a little further here. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Got to give him the glory. Have to give him the glory. Let's talk a little bit more on temptation again because that's what prayer shields us from. You know, when Yahushua was on the mount being tempted by the devil for those 40 days, he was being tempted, and when he finished from being tempted, he was weak when he came down. So that's why he needed to be uh, poured back into. But he stood the test because he had the spirit. Of course, there is no sin in him. But it just goes to show that you have to have prayer in order to overcome the temptation, the desires of the enemy, uh, to, you know, to, to overcome yourself, overcome sin. You, you're not going to make it if you're not praying like you should. You're going to be weak. And it is the, it is of the Lord's mercy, as Scripture says, that we are not consumed. You have to have prayer in your life. Prayer is so vital, you know. They have this little rendition that says, if you don't pray, you won't stay. If you don't fast, you won't last. And I, I, it, 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 it's, it's definitely true because you're going to be doing any kind of thing when you're out there in the world. Let's look at the prayer of Judith. This is in the Apocrypha, of course. Um, she was... 
She was a sister that the Most High raised up to handle business. And she was going up not just the king, but a whole nation of heathens that were trying to wipe out her people. And just like Esther, of course, but she, in her role, was a little different. She, of course, like Esther, had faith. But she had to use physical strength as well to save her nation, the Hebrews, the Jews. Judith chapter 9, we're going to begin at verse 12. I pray thee, I pray thee, O Yahweh of my, O Yahweh of my father, and Yahweh of the inheritance of Israel, Lord of the heavens and earth, creator of the waters, king of every creature, Hear thou my prayer. She needed the Lord to hear her. She went into the presence of the Lord. Because this was, you know, anytime you're taking on a big assignment divine from the Most High, you definitely have to stay in prayer. You definitely know you need the strength and the power of the Lord to be with you. So this was a holy woman that made her petitions and prayers and supplications unto the Most High. Verse 13. And make my speech and deceit to be their wound and strife. She wanted the Most High to use her in every kind of way. Every kind of way. To wound the enemy and let it be their stripes. And that's how the Most High works. People don't understand. The Most High have very powerful, wonderful ways of working. And if he's going to use you, he is going to use you to do just that. Who have, let's read it again, and make my speech and deceit to be their wound and strife, who have purposed cruel things against thy covenant and, and thy hallowed house, the hallowed house of Israel. That's what she's saying. And against the top of Zion and against the house of the possession of thy children children of Israel, verse 14, and make every nation and tribe to acknowledge that thou art Yahweh of all power and all might, and that there is none other that protecteth the people of Israel but thou. She wants, she is praying that the Most High will show himself strong, show up, because she's getting ready to go and be obedient and do what the Most High say. Let's go to Judith chapter 10, verse 1. Now, after that, she has ceased to cry unto the God of Israel, which is Yahweh, and had made an end of all these words. She rose where she had fallen down. So she fell down and was praying. She was down praying. And she called her maiden, maid and went down into the house in the which she abode in the in the Sabbath days and in her feast days. And let's look what she did in verse three, verse three Judah 10, verse 3. And pulled off the sackcloth which she had on. Because see, that's what she did. She, she put on sackcloth and ashes. And went into the presence of the Lord. She put on sackcloth and ashes. Meaning that she got down on the most high. She got down in prayer. Sackcloth and ashes. I mean, you down there in the trenches of prayer when you put on sackcloth and ashes. And pull off the sackcloth which she had on and put off the garments of her widowhood and watch her body all over with water and anointed herself with precious ornament and braided her braided the hair of her head and put on the tire upon it and put on her garments of gladness wherewith she was glad during the life of Manassas, her husband. She was a widow. But she knew how to pray. So we're not going to stop right there because it's going on and giving understanding how she prepared herself. She prepared herself for the battle. That's what she did. She prepared herself for the battle. But she, how did she prepare herself? 
she prepared herself first with prayer, which was the most important preparation, prayer. Before we do anything, that's what we need to do, is pray. Is pray. The weapon of prayer, that's what we're talking about today. Get a few more scriptures here. We have to go and catch part one. This is part two. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 17. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider ye and call for the mourning women, that they may come, and send for the cunning women, that they may come, and let them make haste and take up a wailing for us, that our eyes may run down with tears, and our eyelids gush out with water. For a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion, how we are spoiled, we are greatly confounded because we have forsaken the land because our dwellings have dwellings have cast us out. See, this is, uh, of course, Jeremiah. Let's go one more verse and then I'll explain it. Jeremiah, again, now we're in chapter, verse 20, Jeremiah 9, verse 20 now. Yet hear the word of the Lord, you women. And let your ear receive the word of his mouth and teach your daughters wailing every one her neighbor lamentation. Because there was something about women in the scriptures that knew how to pray. That knew how to just come and lament, uh, take up lamentation of prayer and intercession with supplications unto the Lord. That's just like in our day, you know, the years I've been out there, uh, Many, many years, many years, uh, as you will hear it on the first broadcast, setting up prayer ministries. And women that knew how to pray would, would attend. They would come. And they would pray those prayers. They would pray those prayers, wailing. We will wail. There's something about wailing. In the presence of the Lord, intercession, crying, making supplications unto the Lord. That's a powerful weapon. A powerful weapon. When the Most High see the tears of the saints, the supplications of wailing and crying. It's very powerful prayers. Very powerful prayers. So that's what Jeremiah wanted them to come and do because what? The city was, you know, they were going into captivity. They were being desolated. They, they, Jerusalem was being a desolate place. You know, it was like their heritage was being wiped out. And I think that, you know, I don't know. I just pray that there's still sisters out there that's wailing and making supplications strong with strong tears before the Lord. Strong tears, strong crying, strong praying, strong supplications before the Lord. I just pray you're still out there. And it's more powerful when we come together to pray and wail before the Lord. <clears throat> so like, yeah, because he hears the, the cries of the righteous as we just read. We talk about the weapon of prayer. Prayer is a weapon that will make anything cease in your life. And sometimes you go through things that fortifies you and push you in prayer. Sometimes that's why the Most High allows certain trials we go through. Because He knows that we're going to pray. We're going to pray. When we go through certain things in life, what's the first thing somebody do? Pray. You want to call on God. So if you, you, you're experiencing anything or you're going through anything, that is the most powerful thing you can do is pray and cry out to the Lord. We read about Jehoshaphat prayers as he was facing the battle against Ammon and the Moabites. And he prayed because he said, what? Well, they fear, he feared. And we don't know what to do. So he prayed. When he finished that prayer, one of the prophets gave him the word 
from the Lord that you don't even need to fight in this battle. Just be still. Know that I am God. So the weapon, the weapon of prayer is very powerful. David had prayers. You know what? The whole book of Psalms are filled with prayers. The whole book of Psalms are filled with, with prayers. Even when David sinned before the Lord, he, you know, he acknowledged his sins. And that's what repentance come really good at in, at in that moment when you confess your sins and you pray. When you're praying, you confess your sins. We have, we have to pray, confess our sins. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Be pacific of the sins. Be pacific of your attitude. Be, be pacific of the words that you're repenting of, that, you know, things you should not have done. That's what we need to do. We always have to do that. Because, see, the Most High despises pride for prayers. He despises pride for prayers. Let's look at that real, real quick. I want to look at that. Let's look at, let's go to Luke chapter 18. Because we don't want you to waste your time in prayer. So you want to be able to understand how you should not pray. Because pride goes before a fall. And you're wasting your time down there in prayer if you're praying with a prideful, prideful gesture or prideful words. Okay, let's go to let's go to verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. <clears throat> so like it, this is what he prayed. God, I thank thee that I am not as the other men are. Ex extortioners, unjust, adulter adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Okay, and the publican stand. Now that's what the that's what the Pharisee stood and prayed. We just read it from verse eleven to twelve. Now this is what the publican prayed, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast. Saying, so what he said, let's read it again, verse 13. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. So he was very humble, shame faced it, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be, be merciful to me, a sinner. Okay, and that's what you see this. This is the difference in praying. This is the difference in having a humble prayer and the difference in being a, having prideful prayers. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be a base, and he that humble, him, humble himself shall be exalted. Exalted. So that was the difference in, in, in the prayers of the humble and the prideful. See, prayers have to be prayed, if it's going to be effective, with fervent, powerful, uh, intense uh, desires from the heart, with intensity. Passionate prayers. Just like Yahweh did. Matthew chapter 26. Let's go there. 
if it's going to be felt, that's how it has to be played. If it's going to be, if it's going to make a difference, that's how it has to be played. Let's see here. Verse 36, Then cometh Yahweh with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit you here while I go and pray yonder. Let's skip over to, let's see. Give me a second here. We want to, uh, gotcha, we want this right here. So we want to make sure we, okay. Because some some of the uh, disciples, when they pen the book, um, some of them explain it deeper, go into depth, and give more details than others, and some of them don't. So let's go to Luke. It's going to be still talking about Yahweh Shai in the Garden of Gethsemane. So let's go to Luke chapter 22. We want to look at uh, the intensity of prayer that Yahweh Shai prayed. This is a real journey, a real battle that we're in. And uh, you need power and strength to go through the fire, go through whatever you, 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 you're going to face in life. You can face anything when you have prayer. You can face anything. So let's go to Luke chapter 22. And let's start in. Let's start in verse 42, Luke 22, 42, okay, because, oh, let's go to 41, and then we'll go down. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. So we see the posture of Yahweh Shai is kneeling down, okay, and uh, we also know that there's other postures of prostrating yourself or putting your head down between your knees or standing up, turning to the east, of course. But let's keep going. Verse 42. Saying, Father, if it be thy will, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not thy will, not my will, not my will, Yahweh Shai said, but thine be done. So at this moment, you can see where the Most High had to, you know, strengthen him. The, ver the next verse says it sent the angel to strengthen him, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him because, um, he got a little weak there in human flesh and human form, just like us, came and walked the earth with flesh and blood like us. Of course, you're going to get tired. Of course, you're going to fear and not want to move forward. It's a part of our, all of our nature. But when you the most high, how wish I saw that. The scripture says here, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Strengthening him. That's what prayer does. You cry out to the Lord. He sent an angel to strengthen you, to go with you, to be with you. Verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. The more, the more pain and agony you're in in life, the more prayers you should be laying down. We're followers of Christ. We do as he do. He's preparing and showing us the way the Most High is giving it here in scriptures how we need to uh, conduct ourselves when, when, when the pressure of life is on us, when we're in agony, when you're going through. Pray more earnestly, it says. And his sweat was as it, it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's, that's the profuseness of the prayers coming out of his, perfuterating out of his body. That's how much agony he was in, and that, that is how much harder he was praying. Because it says here, 
and being in agony, agony, he prayed more earnestly, earnestly. Oh, my. he was just in the trenches with the Most High. Oh, he needed the strength. Earnestly. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. See, and again, if you don't pray, you're going to have temptation. You're going to have temptation to say something you don't have no business saying. You're going to have temptation to do something you don't have no business doing. You're not going to, you're going to have temptation. You're not going to even have the strength to pass your tests if you don't pray. This is serious business. The best of the best can fall when they don't pray. When you let up just a little bit. You can't let up. You have to have a life of prayer. Now, I'm not saying everybody is called to be an intercessor. Intercessors are ordained to be intercessors. Let me say it like that. That is a calling that you have to really be equipped for. Because you understand the spiritual battles and you understand the scriptures and how to fervently battle in the spirit like intercessors don't let up and intercessors are very keen in the spirit to discern what's around them intercessors know in the spirit by the spirit most high deals with intercessors they're able to see into the spiritual realm what to pray for how to pray it through, what to pray for. The intercessors can see the enemy. In intercessors are called by the Most High. We know that uh, Anna was an intercessor. Basically, she waited for the consolation of Yahweh in the temple, praying what, day and night. She had to pray it through, pray it through, pray it through. And that's what we do as intercessors. We pray it through. We pray it through. You're not moved when you are in it. You're not so easily moved. You're not moved at all when you're an intercessor. Because you know you got to wait on the Lord. You got to wait for his timing. Because first of all, you know righteous from unrighteous. Holy from unholy. Pure from impure. You know this. So anything that's coming around in the spirit, you can see it afar off, whether it's on your life, somebody else's life, your nations, whatever the Most High is doing, whatever he's letting you know. And he's got intercessors all across the world. So everybody that's coming together as an intercessor in the spirit is making a difference. You really, you, you, you just, you're preventing accidents. You're preventing calamities as an intercessor. intercessors intercessors are very powerful to the kingdom of the Lord we wouldn't be where we are now without intercessors somebody have to watch somebody have to be on the wall praying Let's go a little further here. We want to wrap, start wrapping up the broadcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, let's see here. We want to get, let's go to Acts chapter 4. Just a few more scriptures and then we can close out the broadcast. Acts chapter 4. Thank you all again for tuning in. Talk about the weapon of prayer. Prayer is a mighty weapon. Any evil that's coming upon you, all you got to do is take it to the Lord. Because in time, he's going to fix it. According to his perfect will, he's going to fix it. Let's 
see. So Acts chapter 4, let's look at verse 49. Um, Salakia, Acts chapter 4, verse 29. It says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders be done by thy name of the holy child Yahweh. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spat the word of Yahweh with boldness. See, it's the prayer of boldness. See, prayer gives you that boldness. And that's what the apostles received, the boldness to do what they do. You come out of prayer, you ready. You come out of prayer, you on fire. That's how, and see, but this thing shake in the natural. I've seen prayer have done some things, some shaking as well. In the natural. Supernatural. Manifested in the natural. That's how powerful our God is. He will move. He will move. The weapon of prayer. Prayer is a weapon. Let's go a little further. Let's look at some more, a couple more scriptures concerning this. Let's see, the apostles knew the power of prayer. The apostles knew the power of prayer. Mm -hmm. There's people that's designated to different administrations and different ministries in the body of Christ. But I've always said I was very, very glad the Most High, of course, chose myself to be an intercessor. You have, I just love being on the wall because I know how important it is to pray demons away. We live in this world. This world is not, not all good and not what it appears to be. There are principalities of demons and wickedness in high places trying to work its evil every day. So our prayers go up and send it to the throne. The Most High Commission of Angels to go handle things for us. We see Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16 when they pray. We see the power of prayer there. The power of prayer, the weapon of prayer. Give you boldness. It moves things. The most high shake up some things for you when you pray. Got to be dedicated. You have to know that, look, I got to go pray. You know, some of your friends or family want to do this, want to do that, and have fun all the time. You know, um, my life has just been... A life filled with adventures, of course, you can imagine raising eight children, well, raising seven, the one went on with the Lord, but, um, I mean, just especially all of them were, were in sports, so my life was adventurous, going here, going there, we here, got to be there, meetings and, you know, you know, dealing with schools and so forth. But you know what? I, and, and because of that, I realized how important it was to be an intercessor. And I, you can't you can't let things pull you away from being on the wall. You can feel when your spirit is saying, "I need to go pray," because the world want to suck you in and pull you in. And I'm not having it. That's why we have to be mindful of, of being too busy, like Martha was when Yahushua showed up, but Mary was at his feet. We have to be mindful of that, of the, the, the things that are very needful. 
And prayer is a, definitely a necessity. And you, you can find out that the hard way. Because if you don't pray enough, you're going to fall off. You'll fall off. And then when you think you stand, like the scripture says, you know, be careful or you fall. So then you know you got to pray more. You need to be more fortified in your spirit. Let me say this before we read um, Acts chapter 16. Being an intercessor, you see things different. You see things totally different from a lot, a lot of people. Of course, you definitely see things different from the world, but you see spiritually different. I don't even know if I could explain it to you, but you intercessors out there, you know what I'm talking about. You see life different. There's an alarm inside intercessors. There's an alarm. It's a spiritual divine alarm. And that discernment that we have is always on point. Always on point. In the spirit, there is no hit and miss. It's on point every time with the most high. It's on point. That's why he called who he want to be intercessors because they have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. And um, intercessors know their God. We know Yahweh. That's all I can say. And we go through our trials and tribulations just like anyone else. But we know where to place those trials and tribulations. We know how to handle those things. And we don't even just pray for ourselves. Intercessors have a big responsibility because they pray for everything that's at hand. And as you grow into the shoes of an intercessor in the spirit, you begin to be delegated things of higher matters. Things of higher matters. Mm -hmm. Things of very higher matters. Dealing with nations and people. So let's go a little further here. Acts chapter 16 and um, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto Yahweh. And the prisoners heard them. So they were just... You know, you got time on your hand then. You know, jailhouse rock, let's pray. Sing these praises unto the Lord. And verse 26 says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundation of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open. And everyone Everyone's bands were loose. And the keepers of the prison awaking, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open and he drew out his swords and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, we are all here. Let's start right there, but let's key point here. Verse 25 and verse 26, they prayed. And sing songs unto Yahweh. That's why we Judah. Because Judah love the praise. We know what praise can do. I mean, praise, praise and prayer together are dynamite. You're dynamite when you pray and praise. You're dynamite. You can blow up some things in the spirit that have never happened. That have never come to pass. You can lose some things in the spirit. Blessing, the power, the peace, the prosperity, the goodness, the mercy, the favor. Everything when you pray in praise. It's very powerful. Because what? Look at verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. That's what prayer and praise did. Let me tell you something. Most high will come down for you. 
the Most High will come down for you. I'm a witness. The Most High will come down. He will shake the heavens for his people. He will shake up the heavens. He will shake the earth for his people. You will feel it. You feel it. You feel the trembling in your soul. When you pray in praise. That's why we know we Judah. We Hebrews. We have that power. We're supernatural. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to come back. Our nation has to come back. And serve the Lord in spirit and in truth because they gotta <clears throat> so like you get their power back. They have to get their power. We supernatural beings, they have to get their power back. Once you walk in the spirit with the Lord, you have your power. You know who you are. You know who you are. We're gonna look at get ready to close out here. I want to look at um, well, we know the prayers about Elijah how the most high answered by fire <laughs> I know we know that prayer we know we should know that prayer the most high answered by fire and um it's such a powerful uh, read in scriptures because, let's give me a second here. Let's read it. We want to be able to understand that. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18. Read the Holy Scriptures of the Lord. We think the most high for his word. I mean, you know, people try to keep us from our words, from the power. This is our power. The scriptures are, is our power. See, our, our foremothers. The mothers of Zion knew something about prayer. Mothers of Zion knew something about prayer. Say what you want, you know. The mothers of Zion in the church, they knew something about prayer. That's all they had. That's why we have to be careful when we, you know, talk about the church because we are the church. And the mothers of Zion of the church, of the body of Christ, they know something about prayer. Because that's all they had in the land of their captivity. That's all they had when they was out there in the cotton field. That's all they had when they were being tortured by the oppressors. They learn from their foremothers and forefathers how important prayer is. Prayer is very important. That's all they had. They taught us how to pray. And see, some people don't really know how to be uh, spiritual. You got some people, they want to be in the world. You know, you might have raised up around uh, women and men that were in the world. But having some type of contact or connection with somebody that knew how to pray will set you on your way in life. I saw my mother pray. I didn't see my grandmother pray, but she was a holy woman because we, we lived in another state. But... Just her posture, her presence brought that uh, chastity to my life as a young person as far as understanding how to conduct myself, hold myself. I saw it in my grandmother. And so many other things on the other side and different people and families, you know, you saw the bad influence. But when you see your mother pray, uh, your, your, your auntie's prayer. I saw my auntie's, my aunt, just one, that just was dynamite prayer warrior. 
So as a child, you see those things that have influence on your life. They maybe wasn't perfect, but you did saw them praying. So um, with in 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 my case, deep intercession. So as a child, you want to know about that. You want to know about that. You know? You want to know about that. I remember seeing my mother down there praying uh, with earnest, great earnest prayers with tears as a child. I wanted to know about that. I remember the thought in my mind. I think I was maybe 10 years old, 9 or 10, and I wanted to know about that. What was that? What is she doing? I didn't feel fear. I didn't feel anything. I just wanted to know about it. So we take note of these things. And, you know, the most high probably had me wanting to know what, what she was doing. Because he was getting ready to teach my life. So from an early age, I began to pray. But we're not going to read all of this. But we're going to start in 1 Kings chapter 18. And let's, let's this is a you know, pretty much an extensive chapter. It was a battle between Elijah, of course, and um, the people that were contending against him. Yeah. Let's see here. Make sure you start at a good point. Okay. It was the prophets of Baal, of course, that they were having all of this contention with. And they wanted to challenge Elijah and his God. And pretty much Elijah mocked at them, of course. Because the, the challenge was... Uh, for their God to answer. Let's see here. Let's go a little further down. Start in a good place. So. Let's start in verse 22. First Kings chapter 18 verse 22. Then said Elijah unto the people. I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. And, and this is what Elijah said, of course. He was the only prophet, but the Lord had to show him that, you know, he has uh, another remnant remaining, and we know about that. But the thing is here, he said, but Baal's prophet are 450 men, verse 23. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put fire under it, put fire under. And I will dress the other bullocks and lay it on the wood and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, he's telling them, and I will call on the name of my Lord. And Yahweh that answer by by fire, the God that answered by fire, because you know, Yahweh that answer by fire, because that's what God is going to do. He's going to answer by fire. Let him be God. Let him be Yahweh. And all the people answered and said, It will, it is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophet, prophets of Baal, Baal, choose ye one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For you are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. Okay? And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. <laughs> Even until noon. Because their God wasn't real. So you got all these people with their witchcraft, with their evil spirits. They don't have the power over Yahweh. It's not going to work. Saying, oh Baal, hear us. This is what they, this is what they were praying, the, the uh, prophets of Baal. 
Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. We've got the little G here, lowercase g. Either he's talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey or a pure venture, he sleepeth and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and latches till the blood gushed out upon them. Yeah, because they was just like so embarrassed that God is not answering them. Verse 29, it came to pass when midday was past. And they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any answer, any to answer, nor any that regarded. So th their Baal God, false God, didn't answer them. Verse 30, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as a great, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces. And laid him on the wood. Okay, he's preparing the sacrifice because he know his God's going to show up. Yahweh. And said, fill out, fill four barrels with water and pour it on burnt, uh, burnt sacrifices, Salakia, and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the waters ran about the altar, round about the altar. And he filled the trenches also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, this is his prayer. Yahweh of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art Yahweh in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord Yahweh, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone, the stones. And the dust and lick up the water that was in the trenches. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the He is the God, Yahweh. The Lord, He is the Yahweh. He is the Yahweh. He is God. He is this God is Yahweh. Basically, that's what they saying. The Lord, He is Yahweh. So you see the power. You see the difference. That's the difference in the power of the Most High. If you try to compare him to me to any other God, he's he is the God that, uh, that has all the power. Power has the power. The God that has the power is Yahweh. All right, we want to go to. Here. Revelation chapter 8 verse 4 <clears throat> it's like here. Revelation chapter 8 verse 4 we're going to go ahead and get ready to close out let's talk about the prayers of the saints <clears throat> it's like here, being bottled up Revelations chapter 8, 
and let's look at verse 4. Well, let's look at, I'm sorry, let's, let's start in verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Prayers of the saints. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before Yahweh out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censers and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thundering and lightning and earthquake. Because that, that, that was the prayers of the saints that has much power. That's how much prayers, that's how much power the prayers of the saints had. When we wail out, when we cry out to the Most High. The woman with the issue of blood, she had a prayer life to give her that boldness to want to touch the fringe, the fringes on the garment of Yahweh, Yahweh Shai. She pressed her way through. She had, you know, had this stricken disease for all of these years. But the Most High healed her. Yahweh Shai healed her. The, just her touch of her faith. She pressed through through prayer. You know, oh, because, you know, she didn't really know what was going to happen to her. But she pressed through. And the Most High, Yahweh Shai healed her. See, the Lord is looking for intercessors. The Lord is looking for intercessors. He's looking for us to pray, looking for all of us to, to pray. Those of us that will, you know, um, make ourselves available. So Isaiah chapter 59 tells us how the most high, most high look for intercessors, Salakia, to stand in the gap, to pray, to give ourselves over to prayer. Because when we give ourselves to prayer, we're going to pray exactly, uh, exactly what the most high wants us to do. Your iniquities can separate you from the Lord, the Lord that he don't hear your prayer. We can see that in these scriptures too in Isaiah chapter 59. Let's look at that first. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he would not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, and your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perverseness. None calls for justice, nor pleads for truth. They thus in they trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. These these are the things that hinder prayers, and the Lord, the Most High, doesn't hear those that operate in these type of sins at all. So Isaiah chapter 59 verse 16 says, And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. So he wondered that there was no intercessor. Somebody have to be praying. Somebody got to be on the wall. Somebody. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness it sustained in him. See, he saw that there was no intercessor. You know, Yahusha is an intercessor and a mediator. Intercessor and a mediator. To plead for us. To pray for us. 
That's why the scripture said this will be our last scripture. And how shines at the right hand of the Father, making intercessions for us. Right hand of the Father, making intercessions for us. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Let's, let's read that and we're going to close out. Who is he? <clears throat> Salakia. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of Yahweh, who is also who also make intercessions for us. Salakia, let's read it again. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of Yahweh, who also maketh intercessions for us. So Christ is an intercessor, and he is, he is, at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, praying for us that our faith fails not. He told He told Peter that. I pray, I pray that your faith fail you not. Satan desired to sift you as wheat, but I pray that your faith fail you not. Because at the end of the day, our faith relies upon the choices that we make. So that's why Yahweh Shai had to tell him that. He praying, he's praying for him. But in the next verse in Romans 8, verse 35 now, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or sword? And as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors, Conquerors through him that love us. And we are, he says in verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Yahweh, which is in Christ, Yahweh Shai, our Lord. Mm-hmm. Nothing can separate us from the Lord because Yahweh Shai is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. He's at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for us. So he told Peter, and that was in Luke chapter 22, verse 32, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. Why? Because when you get strong in the spirit, your faith don't fail. You can help someone else. But you look at the prior verse in Luke chapter 22, now verse 31, the, the previous verse. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. This was the whole matter of him telling him, I pray your faith fail you not. Because he knew that Satan wanted to set him up. Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Verse 32, but I have prayed for thee. So all you can do is pray for someone. You can pray for that situation someone is in. You can pray. Lay them prayers on it. He said, I have, but I have prayed for thee that your faith fail you not. Because at the end of the day, it's that person's faith, what they're going to believe. Yahweh Shah told him he's praying for him because Satan desired to sift him as we. But I'm praying your faith don't fail you, that you would do the right thing. You would listen to me and obey the scriptures and keep the commandments. You know, because Peter was weak at moments. Peter was weak. You know, he had something in him with the cussing and, you know, whatever else weakness he had. 
But the Most High is told because he had a great calling on his life. But we saw that after he failed that one time when he denied the Most High, Yahweh Shai Salakia three times, that after that, he got about the Most High's business and was a martyr for the Most High. He didn't allow the enemy to tempt him and do wrong and uh, uh, get him back in that same situation of denying the Most High like Judas did and hung himself headlong. Peter got himself together because the Most High, Yahweh the intercessor, prayed for him. The great intercessor prayed for Peter. He's at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for us that our faith fail us not. So I want to thank everyone for joining me on this second part, part two of the weapon of prayer. I pray that your hearts and your spirits and your mind was encouraged, that you was edified and blessed. So may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Make your face to shine and you have grace and mercy all the days of your life. And you stay on the walls of prayer, intercession, and pour out your hearts before the Lord. Make supplications and cry out unto him. Until next time. Shalom.